So I'm going to just uh, actually just go right down to Mike. I'll let you start there, and then we'll kind of work with the three of us. Hi. Um, I had a couple of comments. Um, we, you were talking about bonding with animals. Um, I think most of us animal lovers kind of already knew this. Um, but when you raise horses, we do what we call imprinting mm -hmm. with the, their ears and their mouth and everything so that they become more domesticated toward humans. And when you were talking about that, I'm thinking, well, that's what we're doing. We're bonding with the animals. And I've talked to somebody just this morning, and she's doing that with her cat. It was with, with the ears, and we do that with our dogs. We think we're just scratching their ears, but we're not just scratching their ears. Right. But I wanted to ask about the gray matter of the brain. When I was quite young, my mom had told me that the difference between human and animal was the gray matter, the thinking part where we can figure things out. And I wanted to ask you about the, the uh, gray matter of the brain. Yeah, well, we have compartments of our brain that's unique to humans. Basically, there are lobes in the front that give us the capacity to uh, do symbolic communication, which is something that the non-human animals don't have. That's the part of our brain that allows us to do philosophy. It supports the spiritual activity of human beings. And sometimes what you'd notice with brain-damaged people, suddenly they lose their capacity for symbolic communication, philosophy, and we begin to think, hey, they're no longer believers. No, the spirit is still there. What has happened is they've lost the brain hardware to support the activities of the spirit. And I actually saw this happen with my mother-in-law when she was dying of dementia, but what I could see on her face was extreme frustration that she was not able to express what her spirit wanted her to express. The spirit was alive within her, but what was missing uh, was the hardware of the brain cells to support that in a way where she could communicate with the outside world. But yeah, we're the only species that actually possesses that kind of hardware. Okay, Hugh. We good? I'll go right here with this one right here. It says, uh, <clears throat> knowing God is um, uh, uh, omnipotent, did he introduce sin to the world so we would be dependent upon him or was sin a result of our free will? And then an uh, extension here is, then how do hurricanes and earthquakes also fit into reason to believe's creation model? Okay, a couple of questions there. And, uh, you know, the reason there's evil and sin in the world is because of the free will expression of fallen angels and us human beings. So it's our free will that brought evil into the world. But God had a plan before he created the universe to deal with that eventuality. So the universe was designed in advance to deal with the sin and evil of angels and human beings. And it's something I didn't mention in my talk. The universe is designed not only to deal with the evil of humanity, it's also designed to deal with the evil of the angelic realm. There's more going on in God's creation than just what we see in the universe and life in the universe. There's another realm he created. And the amazing thing is that the universe is designed to take that into account as well. And the hurricane issue, uh, you'll see this. We don't have the book here, but the book is called More Than a Theory, where I talk about natural disasters and how everything we identify as a natural disaster is actually fine-tuned in the context of the laws of physics to make life maximally beneficial for us human beings. So given that we live in a universe where there's gravity and thermodynamics and electromagnetism, we have hurricanes. But the way God designed our planet and our solar system, we have exactly the right number and intensity of hurricanes to make human civilization as optimal as possible. So, for example, what I explained in more than a theory, what life would be like if there were no hurricanes. If there were no hurricanes, the tropical oceans would heat up to such a great degree, it would kill the life in the tropical oceans, which would have a devastating impact on the rest of the ocean life uh, on the planet. 
hurricanes basically draw heat from the tropical ocean. And notice the hurricanes always move away from the tropics. And what they do is they take that heat and deposit it into the temperate zone. And they also bring rain onto the continental land masses. Now, here in the United States, typically hurricanes bring more rain than we want. Uh, we'd rather have small hurricanes where they're delivered bit by bit. But for example, in India, the agriculture of India critically, critically depends upon the typhoon season. Typhoons are hurricanes, just another name for hurricanes. But without the typhoons, India would not be able to grow sufficient food to feed its population. It brings the water that they need uh, to maintain uh, their intense agricultural activity. Other benefits of hurricanes, they bring chlorophyll from the ocean into the seashores, which is a critical component to maintaining the seashore uh, ecosystem. And there's actually several other things that we benefit from hurricanes. Now, uh, in order to get these benefits, we need a certain minimum number of hurricanes at a certain intensity level, and we're right at that level. So thankfully, there are not more intense hurricanes or more hurricanes, but also there's a word of wisdom in all this. Uh, Jesus said uh, when he was here on earth, do not build your house on the sand. Okay, before the white men came to North America, the Indians avoided uh, the east coast of Florida because they knew that was a place where the hurricane damage risk was high. What do we do instead? We take elderly people that have physical infirmities and we put them in mobile homes on the seashore of the eastern coast of Florida. And the amazing thing is, our elderly grandparents actually agree for us to put them there. It's like, that's building your house on the sand. And so it's our own problem that we have as high of a, a damage and a death rate that we do because we're not wisely taking into account uh, what these things can do. And I could tell the same story about earthquakes, wildfires, uh, tornadoes, and every other form of what we call a natural disaster. They're optimized. Now, God could take it away by simply getting rid of gravity, thermodynamics, and electromagnetism. Then we would have no earthquakes or hurricanes. But evil would run completely out of control. There will come a time when there's no hurricanes, but not until evil has been conquered and permanently eliminated. In the new creation, there's no gravity, there's no thermodynamics. You can get our book out there called Beyond the Cosmos. I tell you what kind of physics you're going to enjoy in the new creation. It's radically different from the physics we have here. Something to look forward to. Wow. Rhonda, I'll go right down to you. Thank you once again for taking my question, and thank you, Grace Church, for bringing uh, Dr. Hugh Ross here today. Three-part question. The significance of the August 21st eclipse and the speculation about what's going to happen September 23rd, the Haladrin Collider and CERN, is that demonic? And the final thing, is there any significance about the four blood moons? Thank you. Okay, stand there because I might not remember all four. <laughs> okay, I'll deal with them in reverse order. Four Blood Moons, there was a movie put out about the Four Blood Moons. I was actually featured in that movie. I was the lone skeptic. Basically, I was the astronomer saying, these Four Blood Moons are really a common phenomenon. You're not familiar with it. They're talking about uh, total lunar eclipses. When you get a total lunar eclipse, uh, the color of the moon becomes red because it's simply getting light reflected off of the Earth. And uh, those happen, uh, you know, twice a year, so they're relatively common. But they were talking, well, this is a tetrad. We get four in a row. And I says, well, you get eight of those in the 21st century. They're not that uncommon. And uh, what was happening is that uh, John Hagee was claiming this was a sign of the fulfillment of prophecy and the coming of the end. And my response was, well, I think you're misreading the prophetic text uh, because what it says is that it's not just the moon that's going to go red, the light of the sun and the stars will go red. We're only talking the moon here, not the sun and the stars. So this isn't the fulfillment of prophecy as you think it is. Moreover, it's nothing to do with eclipses uh, because what turns the light of the sun, moon, and stars uh, into red is dust in the Earth's atmosphere. Now, where you see this prophesied is Revelation. 
where it does talk about how the light of the sun, moon, and stars will go red. It's in Revelation chapter 8. But it also refers to the being at the time when there's going to be forests and grass fires all over the world. That will make the light of the sun, moon, and stars red. So that's the blood moons. The third one was what? Um, the significance of August 21st uh, eclipse and then September 23rd. Okay, let me just deal with those two. Because we had reasons to believe actually at a conference, uh, a conference on the physics of the sun and what it means for life here on planet Earth right on the eclipse path in eastern Oregon. So we had a whole bunch of telescopes there. We watched the eclipse. We had evening star parties, then lectures on the sun. Now, what's special about the August 21st solar eclipse is that it's not just an eclipse of the sun. It's a perfect eclipse of the sun. Very different than what you get with a lunar eclipse because the disk of the moon in the sky is the same size as the disk of the earth. And so we get a solar eclipse the disk of the sun, a moon, perfectly occults the image of the sun. And with a perfect solar eclipse, you get to see the atmosphere of the sun. You get to see the corona of the sun, and you get to see star images right next to the sun. And so one of the lectures I gave was how Einstein in 1917 published his theory of general relativity. And people were very doubtful about this theory, but he made a prediction. He said, if my theory is true, you're going to notice that the gravity of the sun bends the light of stars. And it was a British mathematician, Sir Arthur Eddington, who said, the only way we can see the bending of light by the gravity of the sun is in a perfect solar eclipse. So one year later, he got an expedition to Brazil. They observed the solar eclipse, and they could see that the stars' positions indeed were altered by the gravity of the sun. And basically, Eddington said, if it wasn't for me observing the solar eclipse in 1918, nobody in the world would know who Albert Einstein is. I made him a worldwide famous uh, figure. Now, solar eclipses not only gave us a major proof of the theory of general relativity. If you heard this uh, this morning, I used general relativity as proof that there's a God that created the universe. So yeah, thanks to total solar eclipses, it shows us there must be a God, but it actually does it in multiple ways. Our ability to see the atmosphere and the corona allowed us to build detailed models of the history of stars, which is one of the major pieces of evidence that the Big Bang creation model was correct, a model that had been predicted in the Bible thousands of years ago. So we were all rejoicing over solar eclipses, not just because they're beautiful, but because they testify of God. Now, there are people who are claiming that eclipse is a sign of the end, and they're targeting the event of uh, what's happening with the conjunction of planets uh, in September 23rd, and said so that tells us that we're entering into the uh, final seven years of the tribulation and the return of Christ. Okay, number one, what we're seeing taking place in the constellation of Leo on September 23rd is not that unusual. I don't see it as a sign of the end at all. And moreover, just like I said with the four blood moons, you've got a big problem with the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel makes numerous predictions of what's going to happen in the modern nation of Israel before the end times clock begins to tick. And what I did in the four blood moons and also in several radio interviews on this September 23rd thing is list several unfulfilled prophecies in the modern nation of Israel. For example, Ezekiel tells us, the end times clock will not start ticking until all the Jews of the world are living in the land of Israel. Well, half of them are, but there's a lot of them living in New York City and in Los Angeles. And so until they move to Israel, I don't think it's going to happen. And uh, there's several other. I mean, a major one is Israel will disarm. As long as they're armed to the teeth, uh, that clock can't start ticking. Now, you had one more question. Hopefully, this will be quick. I'm sorry, y'all. Haladrin, the Haladrin Collider oh, yeah. CERN. Okay. Uh, you got to explain to us what that is. I don't okay. know what that is. She's referring to the Large Hadron Collider uh, in Switzerland and France. 
It ranks as the world's largest particle accelerator. And a lot of people have been concerned because they're saying it's going to generate such high energy intensities it might actually produce a black hole that will suck the whole universe into it. And so maybe we should be telling those physicists to tone down what they're doing there at CERN. Now, as an astronomer, I can tell you there's nothing to worry about because we astronomers actually observe energy densities elsewhere in the universe that are way beyond anything that the Large Hadron Collider can achieve. And they're not sucking the whole universe out of existence. So I'm saying, don't worry about the Large Hadron Collider. In fact, I would encourage you to support what they're doing because they're on the verge of making some really major discoveries that are going to help us to be able to seamlessly link our particle creation model with the cosmic creation model. There's actually a cooperative effort going on between particle physicists and astrophysicists uh, to build a much more detailed uh, creation model that's perfectly consistent with what the Bible teaches. So I'm excited about CERN. Yeah. Mike. Another three-part question. Um, last night, I came to your service, and you mentioned in the Bible there are over 300 instances where you could, it predicted the future. Right. And I kind of had a couple of questions that tied together. Um, Mine was, how come in the Bible the other planets aren't mentioned as heavily as Earth? And why is the Earth the only planet that uh, has humans and other forms of life? And my last question was, uh, I had an astronomy, astronomy professor last semester, and one of the students asked about creationism theory, and he kind of shut it down, saying that or everything in the universe has a timeline and basically the sun will explode and the earth will explode in about four and a half billion years. Could you explain that? Yes. Well, let me try to take that in reverse order. Uh, your astronomy professor was correct. The sun is going to get brighter and brighter as it gets older and older. And eventually it will be so bright and so big it will incinerate the earth. That will happen in about four billion years. Uh, but long before that happens, the sun will get too hot uh, for life to exist on Earth. So we're not going to see the incineration event. And frankly, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to fulfill the Great Commission long before uh, that happens. Um, and your second question was? Um, how come Earth is the only planet mentioned okay. in the Bible? How come Earth is the only planet mentioned in the Bible? Well, actually it isn't, because the Bible talks about the bright morning star, which would be a reference to Venus. Venus is the bright morning star. And uh, in fact, if you actually look at Venus at about 4 a.m. in the morning, when it's closest to the Earth, it's so bright you can read a newspaper by it. I mean, it's outstanding. Most people have not seen it like that, but it's a spectacular sight. And the Bible does mention that. Um, and also, there's references in the Bible to the wandering stars. That's a reference to planets. The stars don't move uh, relative to the other stars, but the planets move relative to the stars. And so the ancients knew the difference between planets and stars. One of the things the ancients were able to do is they were able to measure parallax on the planets. They couldn't with the stars, which told them the stars had to be much more distant than the planets. So they knew the planets were relatively close and the stars were far away. In fact, the ancients knew enough to recognize those stars had to be bodies just like our sun, only very, very far away. So yeah, those ancients knew a lot more than we give them credit for. In fact, we astronomers actually use Egyptian records of astronomy to do our research. Why? Because they're documenting what was happening in certain stars three, 4,000 years ago and we can actually look at those stars today, notice the difference, and then use that to build better models of the interior physics of the stars. So the very fact that we're actually using the astronomical data of the ancients tells us uh, that they were a lot smarter than we thought. They knew the Earth was a sphere. They knew the size of the sun. Uh, they knew about eclipses. Your first question? Was, uh, why is Earth the only planet inhabited by humans and other forms of life? Okay. Um, everywhere we look in the universe, we see conditions that are hostile for life. 
Now, my colleagues are speculating there might be a planet out there that might be uh, hospitable for bacteria, but in terms of advanced life, we can't even find a star that's sufficiently like the sun that it could be a candidate to have a planet orbiting it around which life exists, which has caused some of my colleagues to say then, the whole universe is a waste. But as you heard me say, we literally need every single star in order to have the physics on the Earth that would make life possible. Details are in why the universe uh, is uh, the way it is. Having said that, I've been on record since the 1980s. We will find the remains of life on every solar system body. The reason why is Earth has been so abundant with life for such a long period of time that when large meteors hit the Earth, they export Earth's microbes throughout the solar system. So, for example, I've got colleagues who have calculated that on the surface of the Moon, we have 20,000 kilograms of Earth's soil on every 100 square kilometers of the surface of the Moon. And for that reason, there's actually uh, a research effort to get us back to the Moon, instead of recovering pristine lunar rocks, recover that Earth-transported soil. Because every ton of Earth's soil has 100 quadrillion microbes in it. Now, one of the quests of origin of life researchers is to find the fossils of Earth's first life. But the geology of the Earth has destroyed the fossils of Earth's first life. But we know they're on the Moon, and we know they're there in pristine form, because the Moon has virtually no geology. So yeah, I got to speak at NASA Houston saying, let's go to the Moon and see who got the origin of life correct, the theists or the non-theists. And last time I checked, that's 100% of the U.S. taxpayer base. For the sake of time, let's limit the questions to, to one question per person. Do you believe in UFOs? Do I believe in UFOs? Well, I've been handling UFO reports since I was 16 years of age. That's because I was an amateur astronomer before becoming a professional astronomer. And since I knew the night sky, I always got the job of processing UFO reports. 99% of what people report to me as UFOs, I could explain as natural phenomena, military aircraft, or a hoax. But there's a 1% residual that I couldn't explain away. And that 1% we can show is real but we can also show it's non-physical. And one of my professors when I was at the University of Toronto was um, Carl Sagan. And he was adamant that UFOs don't exist. But it's because his worldview does not permit the existence of non-physical reality. As a Christian, my worldview does. And what I document in a book, it's not there at the table, but you can get it from reasons.org. Lights in the sky and little green men. And what I document in that book is there's about 2,000 UFO crash sites where a UFO is observed crashing into the Earth. But as it moves through the atmosphere, no sonic boom, even though it's moving at 20,000 miles per hour. No sonic boom and no heat friction with the atmosphere. If it's a physical object, you're going to get heat friction and you're going to get a sonic boom. And when you go to the crash site, there's no debris, no artifacts. When an aircraft crashes into the Earth, there's always debris. Here, there's nothing. On the other hand, the ground is depressed by one foot. The snow is melted, if there is snow, and the vegetation is damaged, and you see radiation effects. Clearly, something real happened there, but it's not physical. But the Bible tells us that God created two different forms of intelligent life. Intelligent life like us, that's physical, an intelligent life like the angels that's real but non-physical. Now, what I also document in the book is that there are six physicists, in addition to me, who have spent a minimum of 10 years researching the UFO phenomena. None of them are believers, but they all agree with me that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence to what you see in these residual UFOs and what you see in the occult. So their conclusion is whatever is behind the occult is also behind these UFO phenomena. The other thing I document in the book is that when humans have close encounters with these UFOs, 
it's always deleterious. It's never beneficial. The best you're going to come away with are recurring, terrifying nightmares. You say, what's the worst case scenario? People have been killed by these encounters with UFOs. It's always deleterious. Moreover, the messages that are communicated by these so-called UFO beings has always focused on denying the deity of Jesus Christ. The Arantia book is a very good example of that. And so my conclusion is, it's the fallen angels that are responsible for the UFO phenomena. And I close the book off by saying this is scientifically testable. If you close the doors to the occult in your life, there'll be no more UFO encounters in your life. But if you open the doors, it's going to happen. Wow. Rhonda. Yes. Um, thank you for coming to our church. Um, my question is, last night you mentioned that there was some kind of a relationship between gravity and evil. Between gravity, gravity and evil. You said when the, evil, when the gravity is going, the evil will be going? Right. So I was just curious. I don't understand. If you could help us understand. Okay. We live in a universe where gravity pervades the entirety of the universe. It's a manifestation of the mass of bodies in the universe. But if you go to Revelation 21, he talks about the new creation, and it says everything is new. Everything that existed before will be gone. It will all be, so we're looking at a total replacement of the old creation with a brand new creation. And what you see described in Revelation 21, there's going to be a new earth and it's going to be way bigger than the present Earth. Good thing, because there's going to be a lot of saved people. Our planet can't house them all. There's going to be this new Earth, and there's going to be a building that will come out of heaven and sit on the new Earth. And it describes the dimensions of the building. So there's 1,500 stadia by 1,500 stadia by 1,500 stadia. Stadia is a Roman length measurement, roughly equal to one mile. So you've got this pyramidal building, because it's got corners. It's either a cube or a pyramid. But a building that size that's pyramidal or cubical would violate the law of gravity. What you notice with uh, this universe, any body that's bigger uh, than about 300 kilometers in diameter is a sphere. It's because gravity will force any oblong object into a spherical shape if it's sufficiently massive. So it explains why stars and moons and asteroids that are big are all spherical. It's because of the law of gravity. But based on that description, no gravity in the new creation. Now, what I write about and why the universe is the way it is, is why you don't need gravity, because you no longer have evil. You say, how does gravity fit in uh, to the restraint of evil? Well, remember I said in my talk is that uh, God pronounced that he says, the more sin you commit, the more work you're going to have to do, uh, the more pain you're going to experience, and the more time you're going to waste. And God basically built the laws of physics to put that into effect. And it's because of gravity that when we sin, we've got to do more work to overcome the damage of our sin. And likewise, we waste more time and we undergo more pain. I mean, I remember my sons when they were growing up, they would complain about the law of gravity. And so I had to explain to them why the law of gravity was in place to actually restrain them from doing bad things. So, uh, but if you want more detail, you'll find it in why the universe is the way it is. <clears throat> yeah. Dr. Ross, I'd like to thank you for taking my questions. I have many questions, but I'm going to limit it to one. Now, uh, this concerns the death of millions of innocents in the continent of Africa, most by starvation, a horrible, prolonged death. Mm -hmm. And during this period, um, I would say it's logical to assume that there were many intercessory prayers offered Pope, Mother Teresa, individuals such as this. Uh, so, um, I'm wondering why God would not intervene, because these are innocents. I'm talking about right, three-year-old right. three children, four-year-old, five-year-old. Right, uh, right. I mean, 
You understand the implications. They, uh, they haven't, they're not old enough to really have committed any significant sin. I mean, well, I'll give a brief answer to your question, but it's covered in more detail in both why the universe is the way it is and the book Beyond the Cosmos. Basically saying we've got an all-powerful God. God certainly has the power to rescue any of us from starvation, from disasters, uh, hurricanes. He can do that, or wars. He's got the power to do that. And we actually see instances in Scripture and in the lives of individual human beings where God indeed has rescued, but He does that seldomly. He doesn't do it all the time. And Jesus was actually asked this question when He was here on earth, because there was this tower that collapsed and killed people. And His disciples asked Jesus, is it because they were horrible sinners that God had that tower collapse on them? And Jesus said, no, it's not because they were a greater sinner than any of you. Um, and he, Jesus is basically saying, that's simply a consequence of the laws of physics. Things are going to fall down and people are going to get hurt. Now, occasionally God will intervene in a supernatural way to heal someone from a disease, to rescue them from starvation or from a natural disaster. But if He were to do that every single time a human being was in a tight spot like that, it would mitigate the benefit of the laws of physics to restrain us from evil. And so the normative for God is to allow gravity, thermodynamics, and electromagnetism to run their course, because that's the best way uh, to limit the expression of evil and to encourage as many people as possible to seek redemption from Him. The very few times where God supernaturally intervenes to rescue people, it's because the rescue will bring more people to repentance than the running of the laws of physics. So you see that throughout the entire Bible. There are brief instances where God rescues, but He always does it where it's going to bring more people to repentance than letting the laws of physics uh, run their course. And a good example of that is when Jesus turned uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the few loaves and fishes to feed uh, 5,000 people. Notice what happened. The crowd ran after Him and said, do it again. And he said, all you're looking for is the physical benefit. I performed that miracle to teach a spiritual lesson of your need to repent. And now you're chasing after me for the physical benefit, but you're ignoring the spiritual benefit. I will not do the miracle you're asking me to do. And so that's a general principle. Wow. God will perform these miracles of rescue only when it brings about a greater degree of repentance and humility than if He lets the laws of physics run its course. But again, if you want a more detailed explanation why the universe is the way it is and beyond the cosmos. But great question. Thanks. Okay. Dr. Ross, last night you mentioned that Noah's flood was local and not global. What do we do with God's promise after the flood when He says He wouldn't do that flood again, and yet we still have local floods throughout the earth? Okay, very good question, and I actually did a Facebook post on that a few days ago. So you can go to my Facebook page and get a little longer answer uh, to why God said He would never, uh, you know, kill people off with a flood like that. And uh, how do you reconcile that with what's happening in Houston and other parts of the world? Well, if you actually look at what you see in uh, Genesis chapter 9, he's basically saying, I will not wipe out the whole world of the ungodly with a flood ever again. So it doesn't mean he's, there are not going to be local floods like you see in Houston taking place. It just says you won't see a universal flood. So when people say, well, what do you believe about Noah's flood? I hesitate to use the word that I believe the flood was local, because I think it's not just local to a group of humanity. It's the world of the ungodly that was flooded. The entire world of the ungodly was flooded. So I prefer the fact I believe in a universal flood. A universal flood doesn't have to be global if it wipes out all of humanity and all their animals. And so, and what you notice in Genesis, Humanity does not become global until Genesis 10 and 11. Before that, humanity is in the locale of the earth, so God simply has to flood that region to wipe out all of humanity. But just to be clear here, 
the local flood model we hold to it reasons to believe is about four or five times bigger than the traditional old earth creationist flood model because we see it as an ice age event and it's much bigger than the traditional one you see in old earth creationist literature. We think it's way bigger than just the plains of Mesopotamia uh, because we think humanity had inhabited much more of the world than that. So we're talking a really big flood, much bigger than what happened in uh, Houston. And so floods like that are just simply the operation of the laws of physics. They will happen. Um, and the next time it says that God's going to wipe out ungodly humanity uh, with fire and heat, uh, not with water. But it's going to be the entire world of the ungodly, not just a portion of the world. Good. Thank you for your time, Dr. Ross. Uh, do we live in a binary star system? Do we live in a binary star system? There is some speculation that there might be a tiny star that we can't even see that's way, way out there uh, beyond the orbit of the Oort cloud. Um, and you know, that would be debatable whether that would qualify as a binary star. If it's that far away, uh, then how could it be gravitationally attached to the Earth? And so, bottom line is, our star uh, is a bachelor. It doesn't have a partner star. On the other hand, it does have some big planets that orbit it. And uh, the line between a planet and a star is uh, fairly slim. I mean, if you were to make Jupiter 20 times bigger, it would technically be a star. Hi, Dr. Ross. Uh, my question is, in your experience, what has been the best way to build credibility with a skeptic or even a Christian who is hesitant to uh, see Genesis chapter 1 and 2 as a historical and scientific narrative? Okay. How do I help skeptics and some Christians appreciate that uh, Genesis 1 really is historical and scientific? I had talked about that last night and also at the breakfast, men's breakfast, uh, basically making a point. First of all, show them that the point of view for the six creation days is the surface of the earth, not God telling us the account from above the earth, but telling us the account as an observer on the surface of the waters. Genesis 1-2, the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters of planet earth underneath the cloud layer. That to me is the most important point. The second most important point is to show them that the word yom that's translated as day has distinct literal definitions that you can see without any knowledge of Hebrew because clearly three of them are used right there on the first page of the Bible. Creation day one is contrasting days and nights. That's the word yom referring to the daylight hours. And then creation day four contrasts seasons, days, and years. That's day is 24 hours. And Genesis 2-4 uses the word day to refer to the entirety of creation history. That's day as a long period of time. And so skeptics, I think, really appreciate the fact that one of the four literal definitions of the Hebrew word day is a long but finite period of time. Therefore, there is no conflict between the time scale that we see uh, laid out in Genesis 1 and the time scale of geophysics and astrophysics. It's one and the same. And just to give you kind of a brief history, uh, I often find it's helpful to tell people that at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a big debate going on in astronomy. And there was two factions. One faction was saying that the universe was really old. And by old, they meant quadrillions of years. Then there was the young universe faction that was saying it was only billions of years old. And the reason why there was this conflict is that astronomers knew if it's only billions of years, there's no way to save the Darwinian evolutionary uh, model. That's simply not enough time to support a naturalistic origin of life or history of Earth's life. And so astronomers were basically trying to fight to save Darwinism. But eventually the evidence that the universe was only billions of years old became so overwhelming, they had to abandon the old universe model. And so people find it amusing that actually I'm a young universe creationist because I only believe it's billions of years old. But that's actually what's happening in the astronomical uh, community. 
I've got one here as it relates to your message this morning about animals and then how does hunting and killing to eat, how does all that fit in with the animals having a soul and being more relatable when they're connected to humanity? Well, <clears throat> how do you justify hunting these soulish animals? Well, I would find it very difficult to uh, uh, kill one of my pets for food. On the other hand, I had an uncle who had a farm in Nova Scotia, and uh, he made it a point to make pets of all of his uh, beef cattle. And in fact, I saw this. He would come home in his pickup truck, and all the cows would run towards the fence to greet him, and he would, you know, pet all of the cows. His comment was, the fact that they're my pets really raises the quality of the meat. The meat is a whole lot better as a result of that. Now, we laugh, uh, but I've seen that played out in a number of different animals, whether it be goats, pigs, or whatever, is that that's one of the ways you can improve the quality of the meat, is to have that kind of relationship. And my uncle also made the point, you actually make more money, because it costs less to feed them, it costs less to care for them, and, uh, you know, and you get a better quality meat. So he says, it's just good economics, which kind of gives you an idea of what it says in the Bible. Be kind to your animals. A wise man is kind to his animals. So even the ones you're planning to kill, uh, there's some benefit uh, for that. Um, and then if you read my book on Job, you'll notice that Job 39 talks about the deer. There's about a paragraph there about how God has designed the deer to benefit humanity. Well, one of the things about deer is that God designed them in such a way uh, that they live everywhere where we live. I mean, deer are ubiquitous. No matter where we humans live, there are deer. There are many different species of deer, but it's such that we all have access to deer. And the deer seem to be able to handle any kind of habitat. Uh, don't try to fence them in. They're going to jump any fence you build. Uh, but it's such that we have access to wild game no matter where uh, we live. And so I see that as a gift from God. And you actually see that Esau, for example, was hunting deer for his father. So I'm not particularly against hunting, but I would also argue there's a healthy way to hunt. I'll give you an example. My parents lived in British Columbia, but they knew a guy who had a hunting range. He basically had this large piece of property where we'd have Americans come up and hunt. But he said after the Americans left, he would go throughout the herds and thin out the herds. Because he says the hunters would go for the old males. And he said that was not really benefiting the health of the herds. So he would go through and weed out the weak, uh, the sick, and the injured. Because that actually made the herds a lot healthier. And he also says it also makes the population go up and says the problem is, in his game farm, there weren't the predators that would weed out the weak, the, weak, uh, the sick, and uh, the injured. And that's something that predators normally do. And he says the hunters won't do that, so he would go through and take care of that. Uh, but my parents always benefited from his culling, so they always had a freezer filled uh, with the wild game that they produce. And they especially appreciated that he would thin the herds at the right time in their feeding cycle. So making sure that he was giving my parents meat right after uh, these animals had been feeding on wild berries, which really made the meat taste great. And uh, now I'll give you a tip. Don't ever eat bear meat right after salmon season. The bear meat tastes terrible. It tastes just like rotten salmon. You want to eat bear meat right after berry season, then it tastes really good. And you want the young female, you don't want the old male. Okay, I, I apologize. We're, we're gonna have, we got a lunch appointment. He's got to get home today. Can we give Hugh a big hand today? Sure. I, and just real quick, too, you said this earlier, but those that didn't have their questions, lots of questions we didn't get to, you said that they could interact with you on Facebook. Is that right? I answer questions both on Facebook and Twitter, and all you got to do is put my name in on Twitter or name in Facebook. It'll pop right up. And it's also fun to read all the questions everybody else is asking. And I literally get questions from people around the world. So it's fun to see what people in uh, Qatar and Iran and other countries are asking as well.